Totally. Okie dokie. Tonight, we are looking at picking a theme or narrowing the focus. And um, we... we, we <laughs> Take your tablets, Aaron. Take your tablets. <laughs> and we've got, um, now that we've got the MGM lion trying his best. Uh, you should not encourage us. Uh, we, we all have a very bad reputation. There is, there is unfortunately <laughs> something anemic about either your lion or your speakers. One of the two. Spell from homiletics. What does that mean for your career? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seriously. Right. <laughs> A long time ago, I was advised by a colleague that when I began lecturing, I would not for a while be able to see the wood <laughs> for the trees. In other words, it takes time to make sense of a lot of information before we can constructively use it for the particular purpose we wish to put it to. Wilson, in our textbook, looks to choose a theme sentence upon which to base a sermon. He first, he first, though, reminds us of the process that we have taken to reach this important point. As we are aware, for the ordinary Sunday sermon, we, usually ch uh, we can usually choose from four readings. These are the Old Testament reading, a passage from the Psalms, the New Testament reading, and the reading from the Gospels. Though they look disparate, they often have a similar theme running through them. A clue to this theme can be found when we read the collect, or as APBA puts it, the prayer for the day. On the first reading, or readings of the passage, there is a lot to absorb. It's often a good idea to make notes as you read and reflect on the passages. This should be done before you uh, start consulting any commentaries. And as you read, there are some questions that you can ask. And the questions we, can, uh, we, where we ask ourselves are, what is the passage or passages talking about? What are the key words? Which of the passages is the one that stands out? And this is very early in the piece. So sometimes um, things will leap at us. Some will take a little while to, to gel. But those are key questions that you can ask as you're doing this preliminary reading of the passages in preparation for a sermon. The last question is, I believe, important because once we identify the passage that stands out, the process of narrowing things down can rightfully begin. Sometimes it may be that two or, th or possibly three passages stand out. This doesn't always occur, but we should be, at this stage of the development of our sermon, open to all possibilities. And I can't stress that enough. Be open to the possibilities of what you are reading, because sometimes it's the most innocuous reading that becomes the key passage to, to aim for, mm. or um, the key question or the key, key words. So please be open to all possibilities. Even at this early stage, we can begin to think of the direction we believe the Sherman should go. This is not a sudden process or decision, though occasionally things do fall into place very rapidly. Most times, it takes time. This doesn't always occur, but we... Sh oh, sorry. Uh, that is why it's important to have a pattern of preparation that we employ that allows us enough time to organise and write the sermon so we do not leave things to the, last to the last moment. That is, just as we move toward the lectern to mm. preach. And that I can't emphasise enough either. Um, and you know it when you do it. Sometimes, because of circumstance, you find that you, you, do, you are working on your sermon as you are entering the pulpit to preach. There may be a reason for it. Your colleague who was to preach may have suddenly had a heart attack or is unwell. Or as you do, as I did one Saturday afternoon, get a frantic call from, uh, from the cathedral to say the dean had taken suddenly ill and couldn't preach or, and <laughs> literally couldn't take service the next morning. 
So not only was I preaching, I was actually taking the, the, the serv morning services as well. Um, Speak up so our friend here can okay. hear. In the chapel, um, the chapel of the Holy Spirit on campus, uh, Eucharist, um, more than once in the time that I've been here when somebody couldn't come um, and somebody hadn't prepared a sermon rather than try and ad lib, mm. um, they've allowed a time of meditation, yeah. like quiet meditation. Mm. Um, and I think Graham's had a situation he's told me about where somebody's invited uh, the congregation to write their own prayer and then put mm. it on the altar. Um, so they're I don't think we should feel um, imprisoned in the idea that there's there's got to be a sermon uh, following the gospel in a celebration of the Eucharist. That you may not be other ways. Yeah, you wouldn't be imprisoned by it, but at the same time, um, there is an expectation, really, on a Sunday morning, which is the average yes. sort of time, yes. that something will happen. I mean, you try and ask a hundred people to write a prayer and bring it up to the altar does create a few issues as far as movement of people go. But at the same time, if you're in the chapel uh, over, in, over, 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 um, over yeah. at the college, the basically yeah. uh, you, can, you can get away with those sort of things. You want to, don't want to do it too often too because some people say, oh, is that all? You know, and that means they're not in tune <coughs> either. So, um, but, but what I'm trying to hint at at the moment is preparation's a key issue here. Yeah. And, and to give yourself plenty of time to be able to do that. In order that you get the best uh, and uh, get the best result and actually do the best result, Wilson in the textbook, if you look at the contents, divides the chapters to indicate how over a week this preparation and writing occurs, and this is a good pattern. That is doing it over a week, and one that is recommended by many writers in the homiletics field. And, and I think if you pick up any book. Um, on, on, on preaching or homiletics, you'll find that that is a key element of, of quite a number of writers. And though it takes getting used to, once it's embedded in your psyche, then it becomes second nature. This pattern of preparation, though, is for the weekly Sunday sermon. Other special sermons, homilies or addresses may need to have the preparation time compressed depending on the situation. And we can discuss this further. I mean, for example, you don't always have a lot of time if you're preparing for a funeral. You may have to move quickly. Um, you may um, find that, that you've been asked to, to prepare an address for a school service. Well then, yes, you may have a bit more time, but sometimes you don't. Um, it, it's a variable feast, so you do have to look does at it. Every sermon, just every, not every sermon, just every, funeral require a sermon? It, it's a good idea to have one, otherwise, you, you know. Part of the issue is, and this, I think this goes with the theology of why we're, why we're doing a funeral, mm. we're not there so much as to hear all about the deceased and how good they were, as important as that is. We're not just there for that. We're there actually to remind ourselves of the hope we have mm. for both the deceased and ourselves in respect to um, to to uh, to the resurrection and being with with God, I think that's a key element. I think we've gone slowly from the days in funerals where we um, where we, we 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 literally prayed that God would look mercifully on the person as they began their um, as they began you know their their, their non earthly life, but. I think we do have to remind ourselves of the hope that's there. Mm. And, and it is part of the cer ceremony as well. Um, when um, at Nigel's, uh, the service, that the Requiem um, Eucharist that we had for Nigel on Wednesday, and uh, I couldn't help but notice the, the words for Julie's address, like not the eulogy. Well, that's Julie being Julie. Yes, I know. But it did take me to a memory within my own family, um, uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, where the priest would not allow any eulogy. Hmm. The eulogy that wanted to be presented, hmm. the, I guess the, 
the remembrance of the life, mm. um, the person that was doing that on behalf of the family was sent out to the front steps to, was not allowed to do it in the church, had to go out to the front steps to. Mm. Yeah. In so days gone by, I, yeah, we weren't allowed nice to do eulogies. So principle, we're, but yeah. it's hardly pastoral. Yeah, but but the eulogy in on Wednesday was a very good eulogy. Yes. It wasn't the eulogy because you get, you do get a bit, like most clergy, you get a bit thingo about the uh, way in which eulogies often come. You know, you get a, a literally blow by blow of where they were born, what they did, what yeah. school they went to, yeah. who their friends were, what their favourite hobbies were, etc., etc. Um, whereas um, on Wednesday we had a situation where um, once Julie had got through that first little bit of establishing the context of Nigel, yes. she then went on to talk she about did. Nigel as Nigel. Yes, she did. And, uh, and that's where the not the came in. So yes. she would, I mean, yes, she's, I agree. you know, the fact that, you know, he was an athletic person but he couldn't dance, um, which many of us related to. Um, that the beauty of her saying, um, I am a woman of faith and Nigel was a man of faith mm. and I don't want the world to end. I don't want the stars, you know, I don't want the cosmos yeah. to end. I don't want the stars to stop shining. I don't want yeah. the world to stop spinning. They were beautiful things that um, I don't think you would have wanted the service to have not had those. Oh, no, no. And and I think, I think Julie, you know... Uh, experienced as she is knew what she wanted to do she wanted to have something slightly different to the usual sort of homiletic um, eulogistic um, um, history of the person that often comes out which can be quite clinical unfortunately yes, that's true. or it can be overdone just yes. on that Richard it was Peter Cact that gave me some very sage advice on this very subject he stated that um, he's found in the, in the past never to prepare a eulogy or a sermon for a funeral. And the example that he gave was that he, he did such thing on, on one funeral he attended, and he went up to the son who was very close with the father, the deceased, and the son, yeah, wonderful man, he was great, you know, everyone loved him and everything else. Then he went to the daughter, and he said, yeah, how are you going, are you okay? And quote, unquote, she said, I'm glad the bastard's dead. Mm. Yes, I've heard that. I've heard that before too. So, yeah, so the yes. thing was, if he had yes. gone and given a seminal eulogy saying how wonderful this guy was. Yeah. yeah but, but, but the thing is, of course, the priest taking the service should not be giving the eulogy unless, unless the family can't do it. Okay, so what you're saying is that there's a sermon, but the sermon's not about, we're not speaking about an individual, we're speaking about the Christian faith hmm. and the hope and... Hmm. That's why the reading for a funeral is yeah. most important. Yeah. Uh, John um, 6.14, I think if my memory serves me correctly, I'm the resurrection of life, no one comes. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know um, actually the first part is better. You know, um, you know, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many rooms, mansions. And, uh, you know, that type of thing. I like the mansion. Yeah, well, I, I, I've, often talked, I've often talked. I've often talked about the, the, the difference between a room and a mansion, you know, as as part of that particular thing. I have personally said um, and, and written down that I'm not. I don't want a eulogy at my funeral. I want a sermon. Only, and, uh, and you know, enough of me. I mean, I'm not. It's, it's God who who needs to be focused upon from my perspective, and that. But that's my own personal perspective. It's not for everyone. Um, so, um, and I have had funerals too where, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, very few funerals actually, um, where you, 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 you're suddenly told by the family that you, you, you really don't want to, they really don't want to have a, a eulogy because they can't think of a good thing to say about the person who's deceased. Uh, that's very sad. I have had um, two different um, parts of the family literally look daggers of each other across the church mm -hmm. because one sided with the deceased mm -hmm. and the other was again the deceased. You know, it, it's, it's a sort of a, a mixed bag sometimes. And, 
you know, Peter's right. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to play these things well and, and be sensitive to what's what's happening around you. But you should have picked up a lot of those vibes when you went to see the family in the first yeah, place. You interviewed them. Um, um, no, you went to see them. You don't interview them. They're not. You're not after a job. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, what you are doing, though, is is trying to assure them of of. Of, of, of the love that's that's there and trying to uh, uh, work out as a group what what is what is needed for the uh, for the funeral liturgy itself hence you take along your books and you show them what can be done and and uh, you offer them ideas and thoughts and um, and they come up with um, what they would like to have and, and that type of thing so you know it's it's important to um, to look at it as a, as, a, as a pastoral visit, more so than a, than an interview. So, um, could you tell from what you meet with the family in that? Yeah, it varies. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I've started talking about the funeral with the deceased before the deceased has died. Yeah. I had one in, in Bundaberg where we had a, a wonderful, wonderful person, Jill. She had cancer and she, she um, knew it was terminal. 12 months before she actually died. Mm -hmm. So she rang up one day and said, look, Richard, um, can you come down? And uh, I want to talk about my funeral. <laughs> and she had a couple of uh, family members with her and we went through and we chatted about the funeral and we want, you know, she wanted specific things occurring and she was a well-known school teacher and she wanted people to be involved from the school and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. She was the vice principal of, of mm -hmm. the school. So we talked about that. We talked about what she wanted afterwards. She, we talked about uh, the fact that she wanted, because she had been involved with the Aero Club, she wanted to fly past. Um, and, and the Guard of Honour from the school and, and all those sorts of things. And yeah. So we had all that down on paper and we had the liturgy prepared six months before she finally died, which was wonderful in one sense because it saved an awful lot of work. All we had to do was just press buttons when the time came. I mean, in between whiles, I mean, she amazed us by the fact that she just kept going on and turning up at the 9.30 service. And if she couldn't come for the whole of liturgy, she at least came for morning tea armed with sandwiches, mm. which she made. I mean, she, she was a wonderful. So when the day finally arrived, oh, she also wanted the funeral at four o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because she was a school teacher. She wanted colleagues to be present. Mm. They're not available till four o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday. Mm. So, um, so all this was taken into account when we. So, so, um, so that that's 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 one variable. Uh, another one is 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 that you haven't met the deceased at all, and you get suddenly called in to um, to do something. Mm. Um, and of course. Uh, a child's funeral is very different than an adult's funeral. It's, mm. it's quite a mixed bag in that respect. I was going to ask, you know, take this opportunity to delve into your experience and ask how do you deal with addressing a funeral with such delicate issues, an infant's funeral, or a community disaster or event that's... Well, it depends. I mean, in Devonport I had the very, very traumatic situation of a family, uh, my wife's hairdresser. Um, who uh, I got a phone call one day, just get over to East Devonport to this address, which happened to be my wife's hairdresser. Um, something terrible has happened. And I've got over there, and, and what had happened was that she'd put her young son, I think if my memory serves me correctly, it was a while ago now, uh, into the cot to sleep. And it was one of those cots where if you pressed hard enough on the mattress, you've got a space between the, the side and the, the mattress. Mm. So the kid had actually pressed itself, it, with using its head and arms, down, so it got a space, and then started to crawl out and got stuck and choked to death. Bloody hell. And um, um, that was traumatic enough. Uh, and, and that was a very delicate one. Another one in Bundaberg, um, before I went to Devonport, when I was in Jinjin Parish, was the fact that a, a, a father unfortunately backed over his son with the tractor. Mm. And that was a, that was a horrific funeral. 
because it was in Bundaberg and they lived up more Rosedale way, well out of anybody's reach. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you, that particular funeral was, was, was difficult, mainly because of the emotional reaction of the, of the mother. Any key advice for such type of scenario? Just, just quietly take it as it comes. Because to be honest, you don't know what you're going to let yourself in for. Uh, just be careful. Uh, and you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to work. Oh, no, there are no answers for that. Just have to be there. Um, but it was a joy, and that particular one, just before I left the parish, was to have a homestead service where I baptised a new baby mm. from that family. Mm. And that was sort of a closure. I suppose that, that new baby is now married with their own children, uh, which gives you an idea how long ago it was. But, um, but yeah. Shall we continue? Paul Marshall, in his book Preaching for the Church Today, um, is an interesting one. Paul Marshall is an Episcopalian priest and um, a, a teacher of homiletics at that time. I do say he's retired now because I tried book owing Preaching for the Church Today and unfortunately it's not available uh, as a new book. But uh, if anyone wants to borrow my copy, by all means, say so and I can, I can bring it across. It's not upstairs, unfortunately. He offers some key elements on which to model our sermon that we can consider as we work our way through the rich material the passages con contain. And these elements are, the sermon is a pastoral application of a relevant Christian truth to the worship and lives of the hearers. And I think that takes up some of what you were asking about before, Imelda. The second element is, the sermon has one clearly defined objective and um, Marshall calls it the main idea Wilson calls it the central theme or the central sent text sentence it doesn't matter what you call it as long as you, you, can, you can boil it down to that, that sort of focus the third uh, element is the sermon does not violate the Christian message in its method that's a key one. So, uh, as much as you might want to thump the pulpit, don't. Uh, <laughs> the pulpit is not used for that sort of purpose. Although, I must admit, uh, St Luke's Toowoomba pulpit's a good one for thumping. Um, it's solid and breaks your hand. But uh, no, you, you can't violate the Christian message in its method. And the third, uh, the fourth um, element is the sermon is part of the pastoral relationship. And that's another element to keep in mind. It's part of the pastoral relationship. And, and Wilson alludes, alludes to these elements in the chapter reading for this week. The second element is most important. Eventually, we have to arrive at the one clearly defined objective for our sermon that Marshall calls the main idea and Wilson calls the theme sentence. And I think we'll take a break. We've covered a fair bit of ground even in the time that we've uh, done it. Mm. So I'm going to stop the machine and we'll take a break. That, that little, that's not moving forward. Well, I'd love to um, quote that part about the sermon is a partial application. How... OK, we're back on air. Finding the time. This is a very practical and relevant thought. I've already mentioned that we should begin to prepare over the period of a week before I preach, though I am mindful of Canon Rosalind Brown, the author of Can Words Express Our Wonder, Preaching in the Church Today, who's expressed the thought that the preparation of a sermon should begin at least three weeks or more before the day it is preached. This may not be very practical in the busy schedule of parish or school life. However, as we begin our preaching ministry, we may be able to spend more time in our preparation simply due to the fact that we're not preaching every week. If, if that is so, then by all means lengthen the preparation period. This will give you both time and less stress. It will also allow for an important element of the whole preaching process, deep thought and reflection. Why should we do this? 
As we decide about how much time we allot to preparation, we are reminded of why we are preaching and the importance we place on preaching as part of our ministry. I like the bit, no preparation equals no sermon. But I think it's something we, we need to keep in mind. I put it earlier in the piece and then refer to it later. Paul Marshall puts it well when he describes sermons as the meeting places of theology and life. We should, he says, preach only what we believe. Preach only on issues that matter to people. Preach only in a way that allows hearers to appropriate and reuse the power of God. I think they're very key elements that we must keep in mind. Preach only what we believe. Preach only on issues that matter to people. Preach only in a way that allows the hearers to appropriate and use the power of God. And that's all on the, um, on the PowerPoint presentations, mainly for the, the people. In order to achieve these aims, then good preaching is essential. So what sort of practical steps then can we take as we look for the main idea or theme sentence? Marshall and others have stated that we should begin by taking between 20 to 30 minutes each day to prepare our sermon. That means we set aside some uninterrupted time to read through the passages, make some notes and start thinking about the direction our sermon will take. Uninterrupted time I think is, is a very important part of this process because it gives us our reflective and thinking time as we're reading. And it's, it's something which um, you can't just do bitsy, uh, people constantly interrupting you or the phone rings or, you know, shut the email down, um, you know, that type of thing. I know there are some people who, as soon as the email pops up on the screen, they, they have to read the email or something like that. Um, something, someone was a bit upset today, I think, with me when they rang and said, OK, I'll deal with that tomorrow because today I'm just dealing with academic things. So I've decided that Mondays I just deal with academia. I don't worry about emails and I don't worry about, um, and, and be, uh, about uh, phone calls if I can avoid them. And, um, and while my admin office is on holidays, it makes it a little easier for me to do that. But at the same time, you've got to be very firm about that and, uh, and have this uninterrupted time. In saying this, though, there is the realisation that everyone has too much to do. It is a fact of life, and we all respond to it in different ways. However, it is very unhealthy to try to do everything, so we do need to take a healthier approach. And prioritising tasks and managing time is the best way to proceed. I really don't need to state this because it is said in so many different places. Yet in respect to sermon preparation, it needs to be stated. Um, sermons do take time. They require time. And, uh, yet, and, and they will not get written in time if, if, if well, then it will not get written, rather, if time is not planned for them. So, um, you know, if, if you don't plan, you don't get the result. It's as simple as that. If it's any consolation, uh, sorry, the, the 20 or 30 minutes I referred to earlier is the first block of time. It needs to be as early in the week as possible. So Wilson and Marshall advise that Monday is a good day to begin. This may not suit your timetable, especially if your day off happens to be Monday. But the principle remains the same. Begin the process as early as possible. If it's any consolation, it's worth remembering that the poet and dean <coughs> excuse me, of St Paul's Cathedral, London, John Donne, began his sermon preparation on Sunday night. I don't need to say what he was doing on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon. That was John Donne. Setting aside a block of time allows us to think about the readings so that we can arrive at the main idea. If you take time to look through the myriad of books on preaching in the Roscoe Library, 
or look through a clergy person's personal library to see uh, what they have on this topic, you will find plenty of useful hints about organising this block of time and often the best time to do it. <coughs> Marshall and others, for example, say that they work best early in the morning when they are freshest. They see this as a high energy activity. Um, you need to find what works for you. And it's worth deciding this question early in your preaching ministry. You may find that late at night's the best time when it's all quiet and everyone's gone to bed. You may find the afternoon a good time to do these things. I often find the early morning works for me, but I equally find sometimes that um, the, the, the late evening works for me as well because it's quieter and I, I've got time to concentrate. Um, it doesn't quite work in the early afternoon sometimes, but it's worth working through what works for you. Another question to ponder is, how do I actually begin the process? Um, do I just read and go from there? Again, this is a personal decision based on how you wish to do things. Wilson, in the chapter for this week, speaks of the way in which the sermon will deal with the text in responsible ways and will also teach about God and God's relationship with humanity. That being the case, then, it might be worth considering beginning your sermon preparation with a prayer. This, again, is very much a personal decision, but I leave the thought with you for consideration. Have you ever read The Cross and the Switchblade? Yes, mm. good book. Yeah, yeah darn good book. Um, the writer certainly speaks of praying before he prepared his sermons and Bible studies in that book, particularly as he was beginning his ministry in New York um, and, and as he was getting ready. Hmm? With the gangs he was preparing. That's for. correct. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, we might sometimes think, oh, preparing with a prayer sounds a bit trite. But it's, it's a useful way of centering ourselves, I think, sometimes. And, um, but as I say, it's a personal thing and, and is something I just offer as a consideration. The function of the liturgy in sermon preparation. Wilson does not cover this particular point in the chapter, but other writers, including Marshall, have said that the sermon itself can be seen as a liturgical act. It has ritual significance and its existence gives expression to our belief <coughs> that there is a present day word of the Lord. The sermon relates a message from the day's scriptures in such a way as to inform and direct the offering of ourselves symbolically in the liturgy and actively in our lives. Liturgy is not what we, the people of God, just do. The root components of the word liturgy are work for the public, laetos. Sometimes we think of liturgy as work for the people, laos. There's a bit of difference there. Liturgy, though, is really something that we do for the good of all. So when we're praying the liturgy, when we're going through our Eucharist, we are not just working with people who are before us. We're actually upholding the whole of our community and, and, and the whole of the world in prayer. And that's why we're there. What is the final act? What is the final act of, or the final words of any of any Eucharist? Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. It's a going out thing. So you're leaving this place to go out there. The early father John Chrysostom, the early church father John Chrysostom, understood understood preaching as his contribution offered to God for the common good of the assembled Christian people. So our intention as preachers is that from the first moment of preparation it is to preach not for ourselves or a small church consistency, but for the good of the entire community or assembly. The sermon then must be congruent with its setting. It is important that the sermon addresses significant issues 
in a significant way because it is part of a liturgy which is a meeting of God and the church. A sermon, for example, may say some hard things, pronounce judgments and make demands. These things, though, are said to people who will also hear the words of absolution, share the peace of the Lord and receive God's grace through the Eucharist. Sermons then need to be prepared with that context in mind so that the hard or challenging things in sermons always occur in relationship to the power of God to grow, endure and triumph and in the context of our relationship with each other as we share the Eucharistic meal. Liturgy controls the personal element in preaching. We often use the personal pronoun in sermons. First person is shared only to the extent that it offers a connection for the listener to the point being made about human experience. This can be a very positive constraint. It keeps the sermon relevant by keeping its focus on that which most of the listeners uh, can identify. It is important then that we take notice of the context of liturgy as we prepare our sermons or, ho or homilies. So it's very much part of the liturgical act. It is as, as, you know, very much a liturgy in its own right. And then after I'd written that, I came up with, don't forget the main idea, because it was a danger of keeping going. Once we have read the readings a few times, and I stress the words a few times, I was reading once years ago in a, a publication called Multinoma um, Times or whatever it is. It was of a, the magazine of, a, um, of an evangelical American college that turned up on the library at St John's Morpeth as a, one of those regular journal things that we got. Um, where the reader was, well, the writer was talking about his preparation for his series of lectures on the Epistle to the Romans, and he said that he read Romans at least twelve times before he even began to think about the lectures. So, um, so please read the readings a few times, and once we've done that, we're in a position to narrow down our focus towards the main idea or central theme for our sermon. Wilson reminds us that the text says things to us as we read. This, uh, as we are reminded from the first session on Biblical Jesus, is often the first rule. What is the text saying to us? Wilson also reminds us that the sermon is a God event and not a text event. So we continue our focusing by asking what is God doing in and behind the text? As we do this, we are slowly absorbing the text and dealing with it in a responsible way. Sometimes the main idea or central theme is not original. It may have been said before. That is okay. It may be that our central theme or main idea <coughs> excuse me, is a timely one rather than a brand new original one. So you may come up with something that's been said a few years before by someone else, but it's important at the time for it to be restated. And, and that, that is okay. We are aiming to connect our hearers to God and sometimes we need to be reminded of the message that has been preached before. There is the story of uh, the new rector who came to, to the parish and produced a magnificent sermon on love. And everyone commented about it. And, uh, and, and that was great. The next um, week, he, you know, the sermon came and, and the same topic was preached. And so on on the third and fourth weeks. By this stage, the wardens were getting worried. But before they decided to ring the regional bishop and, 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 and um, put forward their worries, they pulled the priest aside and said, um, why, why are you preaching on preaching the same sermon each week. And he says, well, until you start practising it, I won't move on to another topic. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> so it, 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 it's something which... Um, Sounds like a convenient answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's something to, to think about. 
However, um, it, it, you, you, you know, the idea is not to take it too far, of course, and certainly not to the extreme which I've just described. But at the same time, um, it is good to be able to, to restate things that, that have been said before and to be able to perhaps put them in a way that, that allows people to, to, to think a little bit more carefully than they have previously on the topic. Have you ever seen a sermon delivered with uh, an agenda in mind? Say, for example, uh, which the, the priest doesn't feel that there's enough tithing Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Or uh, some kind of uh, you know turmoil of the parish or, or something like that. Too. Yeah. You've got to be very careful when you do things like that, Aaron, for for a number of reasons. Um, I've often had people come to me at the end of a ser service and say, um, "How dare you um, describe me in those terms?" <laughs> and I'm thinking, I didn't even mention them, but it's how they heard the sermon. And they, they took it very personally. And I had to gently point out that perhaps they took it in that particular way simply because there was a need to do that. Mm. Uh, and, and it, but occasionally you'll get that. Unfortunately, if you get up with an agenda in mind other than that which you believe God wants you to preach, then you could be heading for a small element of disaster mm. quite, quite openly. Um, mm. But in so saying that, if you've got something that you want to talk about carefully, uh, you then pray for the words to describe it rather than... Because you can't call people out in a sermon. It's, it's not a you, them, uh, you know. I have heard that done, though. Oh, I have, yeah, yeah, but it, it really is not a good idea. It, it, it is not something which uh, edifies the preacher or, or the church. No. Uh, here we are giving, trying to give people hope. Mm. Here we are trying to get people to think carefully and perhaps make, make a change or two in the way they see things. But to, to call them out won't. It'll just get their backs up. Mm. Richard, do you have any heroes? I mean, people like William Temple or Michael Ramsey or, you know, past figures, if you like. Mm -hmm. you know, that you go back and say, there was a classic sermon. I can't do better. I can modify it. But oh, I must admit, I... I, I don't have too many heroes, to be honest. I mean, I do like the way um, Tom Wright describes things. <coughs> Always have. Um, I like, uh, and, and I maybe now I've got the machine on describing a bit of heresy, but I, I, I never minded Don Cupid. Mm. I had the pleasure of meeting him a number of years ago, and. Uh, you know, the what, way he put things across was quite interesting. Yeah. Um, Peter Carnley, same, because it was Peter Carnley who invited Don Cupid to come to St John's College and, and be in residence for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and that's one thing. Um, I actually don't mind, he's not so much a hero, but I don't mind hearing Bishop Noel Nowak of the, uh, the, the retiring Bishop of the Lutheran Church here in Queensland. Very evangelical preacher. Well, I just like the way he goes about things. It's a conversational thing, you know. You know. And now friends, you know, that type of stuff. And, um, and, and, and you know, he, I, and he uses his inflections well. And, and, and uh, you mightn't always agree with the content, but you certainly their delivery is great. <laughs> And you get involved with it, you know, that type of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are some preachers I, I enjoy hearing. Can, can we ask, does, um, does the Archbishop Philip write his own sermons? Oh, yes. Okay, so I've heard Philip uh, give a sermon here in the chapel, and within three weeks I'd heard that same sermon another two times in other places. And it left me thinking... Like, where did that sermon originate um, hmm. that I was hearing? Hmm. It was the same take on something. Yeah. Well, sometimes you Are get that. Are you telling me that? Mm. I can't remember what the you, take you sometimes was. get that. No, the Archbishop does write his own sermons. I mean... At least he does. Um, I when, when I was... Preaching. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I mean, it's important for us to realise that he spends a lot of time writing his own sermons. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I mean, that doesn't stop others from taking what he says. Yes. And um, 
and using it. Or we all read the same article. <laughs> yes, that's true. And uh, yes. get a, a taste. Sometimes an article can sit, you know, and you suddenly get the same take on yes. a number of, on, 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 a, on an issue that, that um, you might be aware that's being preached in other places, but it's, you know, it just happens that some of those in the congregation have been to a, a previous sermon. And it may be a completely accidental activity. Mm. But no, the Archbishop does prepare his own and writes his own sermons. Mm. And, uh, and, and, uh, and. So he writes his own speeches too, like his speech at Synod? Um, oh, yeah. Is for yeah, his work? yeah. Yeah, that's a five day activity. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that really is a full five day activity. Yeah. I mean, he, he works yeah. assiduously. Like that doesn't mean to say others don't do the research on his behalf yeah. and feed the information to him. But, I mean, he, he looks carefully at what's around, he, he reads a lot. Um, gathers articles and, 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 and thinks carefully about the direction in which he wishes to pitch his address. Mm. Going for growth is one he of them. He teaches that, doesn't he? Like, he doesn't often speak to his students, but um, the message I get from Philip is, like, never stop being involved, never stop reading and learning. Oh, no. Um, because no. you need that to, no. to be... No, he's assiduous about study leave. Mm. He's assiduous about reading. I've, um, we've both been in the situation that we have a stack of books that we've been trying to read for a long time. But he comes to, if he comes across an article, he's willing to share with everyone. So we get that in the Ed Clarem each week or something of that nature. And he comes up with some pithy, pithy um, thought. Some pissy, pithy thought. Yeah, you've got to be careful about the, uh, the microphone. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I was... Um, I was uh, only thinking of that just recently. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's one of those areas where, where yeah, I think you can rest assured that the Archbishop certainly looks mm. carefully at that, yeah, and, and works assiduously. Mm. And you'll see that over the next few days in um, at the conference because he's going to preach one one of those Eucharists. I can assure you. So um, so yeah, keep that in mind. When we're talking about whether we use a, an original thought or, or as our main theme or, or central focus or alternatively um, find one which is timely or aim for one which is timely, um, it's worth remembering that in the chapter we had for this evening, Wilson offers some thoughts and questions we can ask ourselves as we focus on the reading. I'm not going to elaborate on those. What I'm going to ask you to do is have a read of those and you may or may not necessarily agree with what he has to say, but it comes out of his tradition. Um, but it's important to discover if our main idea is one that will both work and is relevant. And if, if, because um, really what we're doing, as I said, is aiming to connect our hearers to God. And, and that, that's an important element of, of what we're on about. It is worth noting that the main theme, or cent main idea or central theme, I always prefer Marshall's to, uh, to Wilson in that respect. Central, central idea speaks to me more. It may not speak to you in the same way. Emerges for some preachers by amassing and then narrowing down the, the data. So they get an awful lot of, they get the readings and then start focusing down. And for others, by reflecting on the already studied material, consciously or not, until the aha, moment comes. Uh, that is why it's important to begin as early as possible. If we can nail the main idea early in the week, the better will be our preparation of the sermon proper. That will give flesh and bones to it. It is also important to remember that we are bringing something to the texts or readings as well. While they are speaking to us, we are reacting to what we are reading. This alerts us to possible central themes or main ideas for us to consider as the effect, uh, as the effect uh, um, of the narrow, uh, you know, as, uh, to consider as, as we go through the narrowing down process. I think we need to remind ourselves too 
It's like EFM. One of the key elements of EFM is not so much how to, um, how to, how to care for people. EFM is, is, is much about what do you learn about yourself. And as you work in the pastoral situation, one of the key issues, uh, as I see it, is that what are my prejudices when I go and see someone? Do you mean EFM or CPE? CPE, sorry. Yeah. CPE, sorry. Clinical pastoral education. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you can be called in a hospital or pastoral situations no matter what. And there are your own built-in prejudices about a particular situation. And you've got to work through those so you can be effective. It's the same with our Bi the way we read the Bible. Sometimes the readings affect us in a way that we have to then think carefully about what that effect actually is and is that relevant to the theme or the main idea we're trying to work towards. So it's, it's well worth keeping that in mind. Um, David Bathsheba uh, reading for the other week comes to mind immediately for some people. Um, can't get away from it in the last few weeks. Can no, you? no, you can't. <laughs> I, I remember one synod, which I think the archbishop, the archbishop was preaching, the synod Eucharist, and it, you know, often the weekday you, uh, readings uh, are just you know, not carefully chosen, but they're there. And it was a real blood and guts Old Testament reading. There was an awful lot of blood and an awful lot of guts, and it was read. And, and you had to be very careful about saying, for the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, that type of reading. And, uh, and, then, and then the archbishop pops up in the pulpit and he says, well, that's certainly a good reading for synod, isn't it? And everyone started laughing. <laughs> you know, it'll, you know it's, it's something to think about carefully. Another one is, um, what, what gets me sometimes is, we, I don't know how we can correct it, but when we're consecrating or, or episcopally ordaining a bishop, the second reading comes from Ephesians and it talks about a bishop, what a bishop should be. And it talks about it, the person, the bishop, in the masculine for, gender form. Mm. And it's a bit rough, it was, you know, because I remember distinctly wondering how are we going to work through this, particularly as we're, as, as it's Bishop Allison who was being consecrated. <laughs> Um, you know, is there another reading we could have used? But there doesn't seem to be another one. So, you know, we react to that and we get upset about that perhaps or we react strongly to something. So it's certainly worth keeping those thoughts in mind as you are arriving at your, at your focus. If you don't mind me asking, talk, talk us through the process. I mean, it's a very interesting statement. I mean, the, the, the masculine, the non-inclusive language, it's such an important event. Talk us through how you try to tackle the problem or, or the powers that be tried to... to they haven't, that's the point. But you have to remember the context. You know, we, well, can't, we can't read the, you know, the Old Testament in the context of today. Oh, true, true. But sometimes you can be a little bit more sensitive to the way in which you uh, choose a reading, for example. Yes, yes, okay. You know, we choose readings to suit the content. We go to a lot of trouble to get the right reading for a funeral. Surely there must be an alternative reading we can use when we're consecrating a, a bishop who is female. And, you know, you know you, 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 context is important. Um, if, if you, if, 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 if uh, you know, and, and the David, you know, the, the David Bathsheba um, reading comes to mind. I mean, how do you work with that sometimes? Uh, and I know what most people have probably done. They've probably stuck to the gospel and not gone anywhere else because it's probably for them the safest thing to do. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I did try and, and, and th try to relate it when I was preaching the other day, but it didn't work when in my mind. If it doesn't work in my mind, don't say it. If you can't work it through in your mind, if you can't see where the bridge is, um, it's best not to go. It's perhaps not where you should be going with your central theme. And uh, or, 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 or main idea. So you know. It was interesting to watch you there because you know a week or two before you were talking about that, and 
you were juggling as though you were trying to bring them together. Yeah, yeah. No, I, by I, the time I asked you how it went, you'd, you'd actually... You'd, rejected it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I had to. Um, and because I, I looked at, at, you know, how mm. do you work it? It's all right talking amongst ourselves over a cup of coffee mm. at the end of a... At the end of a... Um, yeah. At the end of a, 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 a session. So that was true sermon preparation, if you yeah. like, being lived out. Yeah. You, you find yourself um, thinking of something... Yeah. and you find yourself uh, deciding whether or not you can work with it. And that's why, you know, as I said, <coughs> the earlier you can get mm. to a, a, a central or main idea, the important it is, because um, you don't want to be doing this on Saturday evening, I can mm. assure you. But what you, what you can be saying is, will this work or this won't work? Or mm. is this going to, to be something I can, I can follow through on? Or... Alternatively, can I find enough material to to assist me in this respect as well, um, and 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 not be afraid to to say no, no, this isn't going to work. I, I, it doesn't work for me. And yet, in a year or two, you could be coming back to the same readings as we do every three years with the Sunday readings, and you suddenly think, yeah, here's a here's a way that can work. Uh, it may not have been apparent back then, but it is apparent now. And, um, and, and so you, you're, you're open to, to the possibilities of, 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 of change. You don't come back to those readings and say, well, last time I, I aimed for this for my <coughs> major theme, <coughs> excuse me, and, and in the end I failed dismally because it didn't quite work, um, because, you know, I couldn't connect those readings. And, you know, you, you, but you shouldn't, shouldn't feel constrained to then say, well, I, ca I can't do it. You never quite know what's going to happen. And you may find, too, that other things enter into the discussion, like you never thought about the New Testament reading and the Gospel, because the New Testament reading looked a bit in, too innocuous. But then again, it, it, you just don't know where things are going to be at. Um, or the psalm. We neglect the psalms. And yet they're a very important resource. The psalms are the only groups, uh, the only... Well, if you take the Psalms as a book, it's the only book of the Bible that has the complete spectrum of human emotion. Yes. And 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 from the you know, from from the very very hurt to the now, Lord, I want you to get rid of my enemies. It's worse than just as bad as the writings on the wall of Pompeii. You know, mm. um, you know, <laughs> where they write, <laughs> you know. I want dastardly deeds done to so and so, <laughs> those sort of things. But, but Richard, that's that's why the scriptures um, are called the living word. That's true. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, of course, what is the word of the Lord? That's why I don't like things. This is the word of the Lord. It yes. isn't. No. My actual preference is not to have the word of the Lord at all. <coughs> My actual preference is to use another um, response and uh, acclamation response saying, may your word live in us. Mm. And bear much fruit to your glory. And bear much fruit to your glory. It's what we use in um, morning, prayer. morning and evening prayer. That is correct. Yes. Why not use it in the Eucharist? Mm. So the gospel, Shall we change it? During the gospel yeah, reading. It, it, you've got the choice. That's the point. That's the point. Ah. One of the issues is, Read those red little rubrics. rubrics. Yeah, the rubric. And the word may is a fantastic word in APBA. Yeah. It allows a lot of, lever a lot of leeway. Yeah. You have a choice. And I think sometimes um, we've got to remind ourselves that we do get into a groove mm. because that's comfortable. So you'd have no problem with um, during the gospel reading, this is the gospel of the Lord? Well, we, we don't in the cathedral. We say for the gospel. For the gospel, yes, you do. Yes. Um, and 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 we are. What we're saying is for the gospel of the Lord. Uh, now, when you when you get too definite, this is this is. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you you're 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 giving something to the text that perhaps isn't there. Because if you go back to the thirty nine articles, I don't know if you you are like a student I had umpteen years ago at St John's Morpeth who proudly said to me when he arrived at college that he he used the um, um, used the read the Paul Bicknell's uh, commentary on the thirty nine articles as bedtime reading, mm -hmm. 
And his wife said, yeah, he needs to sleep within three seconds. But that's another story. Um, but, but if you go back there, you realise that, that when, you, when you look at, at what they talk, when, what, they, what the, the articles say when you um, talk about the Old and New Testament, it contains everything necessary for salvation. So it's a container. And in that is somewhere the word of the Lord. And so when you say words like, may your word live in us, the word doesn't necessarily remain static for a start. And somewhere in that reading, there is a word from the Lord or readings. It may not be apparent in some of the passages from the Old Testament, but there is something there that we can work with. And it's up to us to, to discern that, and it's up to us to think carefully upon that. I mean, I have many occasions said, why the heck have they put this reading in? Mm. Mm. What sort of masochist was working on the lectionary at that point in time? Mm. You know, and, and it's an honest um, reaction to some readings. But to others, you know, you've got to look mm. carefully. Mm. So it's, it's, well worth, um, it's well worth looking at it very, very in different ways. And be prepared, if you're in charge of a parish, to start adding a new tradition if you feel that it's important to do that. I mean, that's one of the, the elements of some of our clergy. They, they work very quietly, but you suddenly see subtle changes happening. And um, for the gospel of the Lord is part, for the word of the Lord is, is part of that. And you do, and you can, thank God for the word of the Lord. But you're not saying that this is the word of the Lord, when it clearly it obviously isn't. So uh, it's well worth just keeping that in mind. One thing um, that our reactions um, to a, a reading produce is that we have to be honest about it and we have to be honest about the fact that readings can affect us or re we react both positively and negatively. And that keeps our sermon on track because if we know that we have a prejudice against something or a negative reaction, we can we can be aware of that and work with that in in our in our uh, preparation. It will save us the embarrassment of going on our particular hobby horse that may confuse our hearers rather than uplifting them, and that often has happened in times past. Writing things down at this stage also helps us to keep things on track. It helps us as we revise our sermon later on in the process. It also aids our thought processes as we look at what we have written and allow it to give us new insights. It's amazing. We go back and we, we, we read something we've written and think, oh, there's another thought here, you know, and, and so it goes on. Along the way, and this is something which, you know, perhaps counters what cuts across what we were talking about earlier, Imelda, we, we also need to consult all other materials such as commentaries and dictionaries to consolidate consolidate our thinking. They're not the only pieces of material that could aid our research. And I'll say could aid our research. Our main idea may come because we've read a book, watched something on TV or DVD, or heard of an occurrence that has made, made the news broadcasts. These things have connected with the readings that, we are, that we've been considering. And so the aha moment comes. It won't happen in the same way every time. It, um, it, it has to be important. It also has to be important to us because if we cannot relate to our own idea, then the sermon won't make sense either. So, you know, we're not looking for a magic formula to reach a, a main theme that you can say, aha, here it is. It'll vary from, from, from week to week, from sermon to sermon, from reading to reading. It, it all depends on how you, uh, how you go. After all this effort, thought and reflection, uh, what do we arrive at? The answer is a main idea or central theme, that is the sermon in a nutshell. You can sum up your sermon in this main idea or central theme. In other circles, we would call it the main claim. And I go back to my COM 120 subject when, you know, what we ask students to do 
is um, come up with a claim and then uh, develop that into an argument using what we call the standard form. And then from there you do your background research and, and, uh, and from there the, the, the essay develops in draft and, and final form. So, um, and sometimes you, you make a claim, do your background research, that leads to your argument, which then leads to your draft and, and then uh, your essay. So, you know, what you're looking for in a sermon is the same thing, central idea or your main claim. And then once you've got that in your mind, then of course the next step begins, which we'll talk about um, another time. But the idea of focusing on and narrowing down to a central idea is, is probably one of the greatest keys to the development of a sermon. I think that's where I'll end uh, our thoughts on this particular topic. Any, any reactions from anyone?